Greetings and salutations, board game fans. The Dice Pirates are back. This is episode 35. This week, we're going to be diving into a discussion on how do you teach board games. If there's one thing that we all love, it's collecting games. But if there's another thing we love even more, it's sharing those games with other people who may or may not know how to play them. And of course, one of the most difficult parts, especially with games that can be very complicated, is how do you teach that in a way that actually makes sense and gets people involved. So we're going to jump into that because that's something we've all thought about a lot. It's something that Aaron has done actually uh, in a, a professional sense for uh, for a bit with Simon as well. Um, so lots to, uh, lots to talk about there. We'll be getting to that into a bit. But first, uh, of course, I am Ian, your captain, joined by Aaron and Matt. How you guys doing? Ahoy, ahoy. Ahoy. I just want to take some time to thank Mandy Patinkin for bringing us this episode. Um, it, so suddenly, uh, out of nowhere, Mandy Patinkin was the hottest figure in board gaming uh, uh, earlier this week uh, when a viral video of his went, when a video of them learning how to play Wingspan uh, went viral, and it sort of inspired this episode. So uh, if there's never, uh, if there's uh, ever a sign that board games are totally going mainstream, is that Inigo Montoya and his wife are playing Wingspan in their living room, which is something I never thought I would see. It was a hilarious video that I do recommend people check out because it is cool to see somebody enjoying, but also just the hilarity of somebody not versed in, in board games trying to, to pick it up. So we'll link that for sure. Definitely check it out. We're going to move on to our soapboxes, and I want to talk a little bit about Agricola 15. I mentioned this in the captain's log last week, but recently, actually on April 1st, uh, the um, uh, designers of Agricola announced that they are having a 15th anniversary edition of Agricola. It comes in a new box, a very large box. There is new art for it. It is kind of accumulating a lot of sort of the, the best of Agricola over the years. Um, however, there's a lot of odd stuff about this, and that's kind of irked me a little bit. So, obviously, Agricola, a lot like, you know, kind of the other classics like Catan and, and, and Carcassonne, things like this, has a metric ton of expansions. You know, I mean, there are so many expansions for this game, and Agricola 15 does not contain all of them. Now, that, that in and of itself, it, it's fine, you know, I would prefer it contained more than less, especially since it's just cards. Like, some games, like when you pull out a Carcassonne game and you have all of the expansions that's that's a ton of tiles that is so much space but for Agricola especially most of the expansions involve cards so it's odd to me they didn't bring in a bunch of those but they're also missing some very key ones as far as I can tell they're missing a five to six player expansion in there they're missing some of the expansions that people do quite enjoy and the fact is that people have been waiting for a while for a deluxe edition of this game they've been waiting to have something that sort of collects a lot of the expansions together kind of gives them an updated experience and this doesn't seem to be that also compounded by the fact this thing is 150 dollars it's 150 dollars for something that does not contain all of the experience and that's a lot i i just i don't understand my i don't understand who this is for if you love agricola you already have the expansions you already have everything and if you want to get into it and you want to pick up kind of the definitive edition of it, you're not spending $150 on this. Like, the, I just don't see who this was meant to go for. Yeah. $150. $150. And it has two expansion decks and, like, a couple handfuls of promo. Like, uh... Great. Great, yeah. I mean, it's got that... It's got that classic Agricola look and feel, which is to say it looks like garbage. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it does <laughs> I mean, hot it, take it, here. I, I think the art on the new book box looks worse. I think the original was, I mean, there was sort of a charm to how kind of oh, sure. uh, just drab it was. I think the new stuff took it in the wrong direction. It looks it a is... little bit more cartoony, um, and I don't like it. Yeah, they, they sort of have Simpson-y looking eyes kind of big white cartoony eyes i don't know uh yeah i don't love this i'm blown away by the idea that anybody would pay that much for like not even all of the content and not like a significant upgrade in art and components it's just you know a euro game it has all the charm and warmth of a history textbook 
And just the, I mean, the absolute audacity to release, because it's not like they're releasing a, you know, something you'll see, especially in, in games that have had a long tail of popularity and have had a bunch of expansions. Occasionally the publisher will sell, like, a standalone thing, just a big box to hold all the crap that you own, right? Uh, Stonemeyer has done that with Scythe. Uh, they just announced they're going to have a big box for Viticulture. Um, you know, I've got uh, Role Player has a an absolutely massive uh, Gloomhaven size box to hold all the stuff for that, and that makes sense when it's when it's a thing for people who already have all of this stuff. It's a premium, low number of units produced. Obviously, the cost is going to be higher. I can swallow that a lot better than here's a big box that has the base game and a couple of the things, and then you can just go out and buy the rest if they're in print, I guess. Have fun. And like Ian said, it's cards. How how much does it cost to print a deck of cards? Not much. Not, not a whole much, lot, no. especially <laughs> if it's you know 50 54 cards all the backs are the same that's that's nothing like if you amortize the cost of that across however you know 10 20 thousand units that you're making it costs you nothing extra so like why not just if you're if it's going to be 150 dollars if it's going to take up an entire cube in your your ikea calyx shelf then like <laughs> make it the whole thing i just i don't understand why you would release and at that price point like uh castles of burgundy famously a couple years ago had the uh anniversary edition and it had every expansion it had every promo including stuff that you know some of the promo boards had only ever been released in one issue of a tabletop gaming magazine in germany so your only way to buy that was to find somebody on Etsy who was selling it illegally and then get it shipped to you and then they had the anniversary <laughs> edition and it was every board that's ever been released all the promos they even added a couple extra promos and it was 60 bucks yeah, yeah not outrageously priced it was priced like a what a new board game like starting point price right. probably and it was be. the size of I mean it was the size of the game it didn't take up any extra it was maybe a little bit taller or deeper but like well, that's the difference that like a few years makes, right? Like the game industry's hot, and I guess everybody right now is. I feel like we're in a really terrifying race to see what is, what's the upper limit that people will pay for a board game. What's the go? Like what? How high? How much can we really charge? And, and, and sometimes uh, it makes sense. Like sometimes I get it. There's a reason. Like for instance, we're about to talk about the Castles of Burgundy Deluxe Edition. Matt, you're gonna you're gonna gush about that, I know. But that's like. You know, and not to get ahead of ourselves, but and I'm sure we'll compare it, but there's like a very different like set of situations happening here. Like, yeah, people are going to spend a lot of money and things are getting big and, and huge to the point of excess. Absolutely. Um, but like this in particular was just a very odd. Yeah. Like place to be just because a lot of the people like that are responding to are just like, I don't understand. Like, why would I get this? Like, what is the purpose of getting this? You know, it's not. You know, I mean, it's a nice big box. You know, that's kind of the only a better thing you get. But are you going to reprint all the the expansions in the new style? Like, what's going to happen? You know, like, if do I have to rebuy everything again? Like, it just it, it seems like it was poorly conceived from the get go. Like, honest to goodness, if it was just the big box and like all of the promos, that would make more sense not, yeah. to me. Even at one hundred and fifty dollars, the fact that it includes the base game. And a couple other decks is almost a slap in the face because it's like, who is this actually for? Because clearly it's not for people who already own everything and just want one nice purpose-built box to sit on the shelf to have everything because the artwork won't match with what you already own and it's got an extra copy of the base game that you already own. And it's certainly not for people who want to pick up their first copy of Agricola because, I mean, $150, you can get, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead and say it, a much better board game 
or even a you whole get several pile much better of board games. games. Like that's such a weird will, thing and price point at the same time. I will sell you several of my games for one hundred fifty dollars if anyone is so interested. Has to spend hundred fifty dollars. That's dice pirates uh, on Instagram.com. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Matt Stash, uh, subject line in your email. Um, <laughs> uh, all right, but this is probably a good point to, any, to transition to our next uh, thing, which is very much related to this, which is another deluxe edition that's coming out and has is making waves in uh, on the in, on board game uh, media, which is a wild and lavish looking new edition of castles of burgundy that is currently on game found and this is also uh, weird to, to me from a, yeah coming to us from awaken realms now i don't know about awaken realms should i what have they done i don't know them but i do know that they have come up with some concepts for some absolutely spectacular looking art to revamp the look and feel of a game that is famously real real good but real real ugly so you um, like the artwork i do like the artwork do you not like the artwork and why is your soul dead uh so i will i will certainly allow i'm not gonna to, to argue that the artwork in castles of burgundy is somewhere on the spectrum of ineffective to objectionable <laughs> Because a lot of the, especially the building tiles, and that's, I feel like, where a lot of people get hung up. Yeah. You, some of them you genuinely cannot tell from looking at them. And, like, like the buildings are the thing you always have to reference. Like, what's the one with the red roof? I don't know. What's the book say? I've played the game a whole bunch. Anytime I play it, you know, yeah. online or, or in person, I always have to reference what each of the buildings are and what they actually do. Because the artwork tells me... The artwork is basically look for this picture in the rule book to see yeah. what this well, it, does. It's the same basic like idea that you had with like Agricola, where like you don't play it because it looks pretty, you play it because it's a good game. You know, well, like, yeah. There's nothing inspiring about the art in Castles of Burgundy. It's 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 a product of a different era. It has very simple Euro style gaming art that was typical at the time the game was made. But it's not even just that the art is is sort of bland. It's not bad. It's all very recognizable what it is. I mean, it's sheep and castles and things that you can tell what it is. It's just all very bland. The game board in particular is overwhelmingly beige in a way that is depressingly awful. And but it's also the components themselves are just cheap quality. It's like cheap cardboard. It's a cheap cheaply made board. The whole thing just feels flimsy. So in our era of the luxury edition of a board game, where everything is like primo and tactile and incredibly satisfying to look and to hold, board, uh, Castles of Burgundy all the more looks archaic and terrible. So uh, this new edition that they're proposing to put out, though, uh, has big, vibrant, colorful, almost fantasy-looking art, which I can see might be off-putting to some people, but it's just really really a wild uh, change of pace uh there's new concepts for the player boards and the all of this stuff metal coins yes and a big 3d resin castle which I, is hilarious uh i don't quite know what to make of this i think there's some big uh grains of salt we have to keep with this if you carefully if you go to this fundraising page for this on game file the first thing that you are alerted to is that this is a still in draft mode and if you carefully go down and look a lot of there's there's notes on here about how these are concepts so we haven't actually seen what this is going to look like yet so there's a certain amount of just like you know we need to wait a little bit longer to get a better feel for it we also have no idea what they're going to be attempting to charge for this like or what the fundraising you know levels are going to be the campaign's not officially started I strongly suspect this is going to be another $100 plus game. Uh, I would probably be inclined to play it on to pay it <laughs> in this case because it's a more substantive and like a real upgrade to the game experience than that Agricola nonsense that we just saw. Like this feels like, okay, I love Burgundy. It's truly, you know, one of my top two or three games. And, uh, I know that I would play this. I know I know that this would fully supplant my old edition of it. And if I was ever going to pay like a luxury price for a game, I want it to look and feel like what they're presenting here. But I definitely got to wait and see before I buy it. 
it's going to be interesting to see where it lands on terms of price. But yeah, I mean, this it's interesting talking about these two back to back because I just feel like this this has a market. Like you know, we talked about you know the race to the the race to the absolute limit of of cost. But I can see that the whole point is that people have wanted for you know years and years an incredibly nice looking version of Castles of Burgundy, which ostensibly they were supposed to have gotten with you know the, the edition that came out recently but a lot of people also did not quite like and so no. i can see an, a ridiculously overproduced version of this game for those who adore the game actually making sense so it, it kind of you know I mean, the price point is going to be you know a, a sticking point when it gets there but it, it makes sense to me well if you're all, i guess my take on price kind of uh, talking about both these editions is really like if if you're offering something to justify the cost then 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 do it you know like if you're if you're offering either really nice components and quality or a significantly huge robust game something like gloomhaven then yeah let's charge charge 100 plus dollars you know it, it, people have to decide if they want to pay that but if you have a product but I, i'm worried that more and more people are just going to slap deluxe edition on something and call it and it's a cash grab you know look it's a big box it says deluxe but it's just, there's just nothing in there and so there's a little bit of buyer beware we got to have out there and just consumers educate yourselves i guess Matt, before we move on, I just wanted to just real quick, because, of course, you kind of almost spoke this into existence. You have been talking how much you wanted this. What did you think when you saw this and you were like, that's a 3D castle for castles? What did you feel? Honestly, it's more uh, elaborate than I uh, even visualized in my mind, to be perfectly honest. It's, it's more over the top than I even went. The metal coins. The 3D castle is the thing that I just keep. Like, it just makes me laugh. Because I'm picturing it sitting on your player board alongside the little hexagons of your tableau. And it, it just it will look ludicrous and wonderful at the same time. Uh, if you've been listening to the show for a while, you know I've brought this up on multiple occasions. That my dream was for a publisher to do a primo luxury edition of this game uh i in fact pitched it to jamie Bur <laughs> jamie burgundy i pitched it to jamie stegmar <laughs> when we had him on as a guest i actually was like this is perfect thing for stonemeyer to do and so uh when i first saw somebody send it to our group chat and i saw the screenshot and i was like oh my gosh if stonemeyer is doing this then i deserve full credit for making this happen but it's not stonemeyer so i don't get total credit but i do feel like somehow karmically like i put out the energy and made this happen so i i do i do take credit uh thank me uh but yeah it's crazy i do i love it i love the art i love the, everything i'm seeing so far but i'm also very skeptical about what it will like really be and i want to know more about the uh quality of like the components like what they're going to feel like i want to know more about what the player board is going to like look and feel like like the picture i'm seeing of the player board does look recess which is like my number one dream thing is that the the hexagons will slot down into a little space and not slide around that's the one quality of life thing that i would love the most is that my little village would not be constantly shifting i have to like rearrange it all the time i can't wait to see what it actually looks like once they get through like their proof of concept and they start getting into it that's going to be exciting we're going to move on we're going to do a, a real quick rule book randomness of course we're going to be talking about teaching games so we kind of wanted to just, you know, again, enjoy some of how ridiculous uh, rule books can be and how kind of dumb it can. So I'm actually going to lead off with one that not as crazy as some of those we've talked to, talked about, but I thought it was pretty funny just because it keeps throwing terms at you. And uh, so this is actually from Pendulum, uh, Matt's favorite game. Players must immediately call council when a player flips the purple timer and knocks the last purple time marker cube off its space, not just from off the row. After calling council, players may continue taking actions. Although, if more than one player wishes to act last, break this tie by claiming privilege. What? I've played this game and I still don't understand that. Claiming, I claim privilege. <laughs> what does that I, even mean? <laughs> I'm so sad that we didn't get to play this together the last time we came down because I just, I desperately wanted to, to get to enjoy that with you again. Or I wanted to enjoy it. I wanted to see your brain explode. Uh, I, I like that. That is a good example of rule book randomness. And it's a good example of like why that Wingspan video was so hilarious, which I want to talk more about that when we get into our main discussion. But it's like so many rules in board games have these like noun soup in it that you have to like 
no you have to understand the vocabulary of the game so deeply to make sense of any one section so like what is privilege in this context and what is power and like what is the why is it i think off what does it say not off the row but off the something like there's all these concepts within that one rule rule that you have to understand to make sense of anything it's like a it's a, it's just crazy we're actually going to throw it over to Aaron now, who has who has another submission for rulebook randomness. So this is a, a weird rule from, admittedly, a very weird game. Uh, the name of the game is Consentical. It's a collaborative card game of trust, intimacy, and communication for one well, human and one alien already. player. Uh, and the, uh, the picture that you have well, in your mind is pretty accurate. Uh, this is about... Uh, 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 an alien encountering a curious tentacle, or a curious human encountering a tentacled alien in space, and it's about playing cards and and uh, creating intimacy. So in the in the rules, in the rules, it lists the five types of action cards, and uh, specifically types three and four. Uh, type three: if you have matched pairs of red and blue trust tokens in the intimacy pool. These cards let you change pairs into one satisfaction token per pair. And then type 4 is once you've created some satisfaction tokens, these cards let you take one or more out of the intimacy pool and place them on your identity card. Oh boy. <laughs> well, now I just feel dirty. And uh, there's... Satisfaction tokens? Yes. And there's, there's, there's two I'll modes like some, of play. Uh... Uh, there's practice consent and consent challenge. And in consent challenge, you're only allowed to communicate with the other players with your with the other player with your eyes. Just suggestive uh, eyebrow wiggles and winks. Satisfaction tokens. Uh, that's the most uh, sad and clinical like description uh, of intimacy that I feel like I've ever heard. May you have a satisfaction token. <laughs> Here you go. Here you go. Take a token. Then, take a token. Thank you. <laughs> uh all right that's fine it is another good example though of just throwing word salad into a bowl and seeing what falls out we are going to go ahead and move on to our main topic we're going to take a quick break we'll be right back all righty and welcome back to the dice pirates and we're going to go ahead and dive into our main topic this week which is how the heck do you teach board games if you have been playing board games for any length of time, then you have had this moment uh, that I like to call the moment of panic, where you are trying to teach a board game to uh, a group of people who you have invited into your home with the earnest promise that they're going to have a real good time. And you realize suddenly that you have been talking on an unbroken stream of words for about 15 minutes and their eyes have turned to glass and you no longer recognize anything that is coming out of your mouth. And that is what it is like to teach board games sometimes. Uh, the esoteric language, the labyrinthian uh, passages and sentences in the rule book, and uh, trying to get people to understand what it is that we're about to do and uh, repeatedly uh, uttering this uh, classic phrase. It sounds complicated. But once we get started, I promise you, it'll make perfect sense. Uh, <laughs> so uh, how do you get better at that? How do you avoid those uh, total moments of panic when you're teaching? Um, the inspiration for this episode, like we alluded to at the top, was the absolutely hilarious uh, video of Mandy Patinkin and family uh, trying to play Wingspan, a game that a lot of experienced gamers would say is pretty light and easy to understand. But watching it through the eyes of... Uh, some non-gamers, you do realize that, yeah, that game's pretty dense in its own way with archaic language. And um, it is uh, it's sort of a reminder that, like, this, this, this hobby can be a bit inscrutable. So how do we get better at it? So um, to get started, uh, I'm going to toss it over to Aaron. Aaron has been teaching games for probably longer than any of us on the show. Uh, Aaron, how do, you make, how do you teach board games, man? So... Like you said, I, I did uh, Rest in Peace, Simon Legion. I did used to top board games about as, as professionally a capacity as you can outside of being someone like Rodney Smith or Paul Grogan, you know, who has YouTube videos and, and actual scripts. Uh, the very first thing you should do is don't try and teach it the first time you play it. And what I mean by that is 
if you are tearing off shrink wrap and opening up packs of cards in front of other people, you have messed up. What you need to do is go back in time to yesterday, open it up, sit down at the table, take everything out of the box, and learn how to play the game yourself. And I don't just mean, okay, you know, flip through the rule book, and okay, so that's what that card does. But like actually set everything out in front of you so you know what it's going to look like as you're playing the game. Because otherwise, one turn into the game, someone's going to say, well, what does that do? And you're going to go, oh yeah, that does uh, flip, 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 flip. Um, that is for... Uh, that's how you turn the iron into gears. Well, what does that mean? I, that, does, that doesn't mean anything to anybody. That, that makes no sense. So sit down with the game, play the game, and, you know, if, if possible, if you've got the time, play through the entire game. Do it two-handed if you've got to, if it's the sort of game where you've got to do that, even if it's something where you're going to have to try and make plays against yourself based on hidden information. Like, it's, it's not enough to just know the rules of the game, but to really understand the flow of the game. To figure out not just what you're doing, but why you're doing it. And, you know, the, the deeper implications of things. Um, I think that is the key uh, element to it, to me, is understanding why you're doing any of these weird, obscure actions. And so I think a great starting point for teaching your game to that end is uh, start at the end and go ahead and explain uh, the goal of the game and even like up to like in-game scoring because people need to understand like what is the point of this game and how does it all like play out this is how you win you score you, 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 you know the goal of the game is to score victory points this is how you score victory points and that seems like a lot but everything our brain the way like our brains work or at least the way my brain works if I don't understand the context for this if you're telling me like you know, play this card to harvest wheat and place it on the wheat thresher. And then the thresher goes to the thing. And I'm just like, what's the point of any of that? I need to understand that the, the, the goal of the game is you're a bread maker and you have to make bread. And when you turn in bread loaves to the factory, you make points. Okay, I get it now. So all of the steps are like the steps toward making bread. And this is the game I'm pitching to you, bread meister. Uh, we're going to make this. Um, there's got to be a game about making bread. If that doesn't exist, come on. But yeah, you know, I think understanding the end game uh, is what uh, puts all of the other rules in context. I think the first mistake that, that we make is to just dive right into the actions you take on your turn. Because we think that's, we think you need to get that in your head like first. I would definitely say as well, I mean, that is hugely important because making sure that somebody, you, like the first thing you say is going to be what they remember most like i mean no matter how engaged somebody is after you've talked for five minutes this it's going to merge into itself a little bit they're not going to remember everything you say it's impossible to remember all of the little fiddly rules so when you start out and you say okay viticulture is a game where you're scoring the most victory points by making wine and selling it to people win these orders that's how you play the game and mm -hmm. they're going to remember that's how I win. I have to get the wine at all costs, you know? So, like, you have to start with that. But also, I think it's important to make sure they have a reason to engage with what they're doing. Like, when you start out, make sure you, like, try to give them a hook, you know, especially depending on, like, the, the type of people you're playing with, but especially people who are newer to games. It helps to really give them a reason that they are playing the game. Like, you don't just want to give them the end goal. You want to give them sort of, like, very much like this is the sort of thing that Matt really loves is to have, to know who you are as a character. You right. know, who are you and what are you trying to do? Like, when you're playing Viticulture, where well, you are, you own a vineyard. You know, that's the whole point. You are the mama and papa that you have chosen. You know, if you're playing the uh, Star Wars Outer Rim, you are, you know, a titular Star Wars character. You know, so, like, you yeah. get... There are, if you can explain that part of it too, and people can inhabit their character, it's going to be a lot easier for them to navigate the space of the game if they know why and who they are in that space. Start starting at the end is, is best. Uh, you know, as, as soon as you tell me, so in this game you have to have the most points. Okay, got it. So I need to do things that give me points. Or to win this game, you have to occupy eight regions of the map at the end of your turn. Perfect. I can go back from that because that that's the first thing you said. I'm all you know uh, something you'll you'll learn if you 
take up like public speaking classes, people remember the first thing you told them and the last thing you told them. Everything else is just going to slowly leak out. So lead with, what are we doing, right? Are we, is this a co-op? Are we fighting each other? How do I win? And then when you get to the, you know, and you get to the end, uh, I would say next step, most importantly, is if there is stuff that I, go ahead, give people their stuff. Give people their player boards, give people their, their meeples and their coins. I would, and some people will disagree with me, I would not give anyone cards to start off with unless it is a cards only game. Because as soon as you hand me my cards, I'm immediately picking them up and looking at them and reading them. And because I'm reading, I can't listen anymore. And so whatever you tell me while I'm looking at those cards is immediately gone. But if you give me my little toys to play with, I'm still listening to you and I'm more engaged in the game because I've got, I'm, I'm physically engaged with it now. So anyone who kind of wasn't paying attention already, because, you know, there's always that one person at the table, you open up the box, you're setting out stuff, you're explaining rules, and they're still on Twitter or whatever. If I hand you your player board and I hand you your guys and your coins, yeah, you're in the game now. You are now involved. You are you are back at the table. You are inside the circle because you got to put your board in your place and you got to put the little guys and the little spaces for your little guys. And that physical engagement does lead to the mental engagement. Because now you have your pieces and now you want to know what they do and how you use them. And that's why, you know, like I said, don't don't give people cards. Because as, as soon as you hand someone cards, they're picking them up and they're looking at the cards and they're seeing what's on the cards. And they, they, they're not listening anymore because they're reading the cards and they don't know what the cards mean, but they're trying to figure it out. Because especially people who play a lot of board games, they're going to be like, okay, rest, that's a familiar mechanic. Attack, that's a familiar mechanic. And they're trying to interpret what it means in a vacuum. So don't give people cards, but do give them their dice, their little boys, their little dudes, their coins, all of that. Your trashkeys. That's a great point that I hadn't really thought about. And it makes me think of something that I try to do and haven't always been successful at when I've hosted like big game nights in the past is having the game set up when people arrive is a really great like little classy touch that kind of sets things off correctly. Because there's already a certain amount of like boredom and tedium and watching somebody set up a game. Unless you are a hardcore gaming uh, nerd and you want to like watch that because I am fine with that. But if you're definitely if you're trying to introduce somebody to a game and it's fairly complex, have it all set up because then to Aaron's point that he was just making, as soon as your guests arrive and sit down at the table and start looking at it, they're already having to start familiarizing themselves with the play space and the iconography of the board and they're probably gonna start asking questions. So the learning will start more organically and you and you remove one of those like points of like awkwardness and overwhelmingness, which is like watching all the stuff come out in the box and people's brains start going, oh, what did I just agree to do for the next two hours? Like what? <laughs> Why are there colorful eggs? What's happening? I think another point that I would, so once you've started, you're getting into the game and this is going to vary for who you're playing with, of course. Like, we're sitting down with Max and, and Dennis, and uh, we're going to go over all the rules very carefully. We're going to make sure everybody had, knows exactly how to play the game, you know. And I'm sure for you, Aaron, a lot of the times the people coming to play are game fans, and they're going to want to know, how do I get everything? But I think a big thing to remember is, especially if you're hosting a game night where people are, are coming and maybe aren't used to it, is that you need to make sure you're getting into things fairly quickly. Like you don't want to, you don't need to get into the minutia of how to play the game. You want to give people the overarching mechanics. You want to give them the basics of how do you do stuff, but you don't need to get into edge cases. You don't even need to get into every single mechanic. If the mechanics may be a rare one or one that comes out outside, you want to get people into the game and you can continue to explain as the game goes on. But as long as people know how to play and get started, just getting into it and having that first couple turns is going to be a huge step along the way. This is why something, I think like uh, games that have built in tutorials such as Wingspan and Root are a huge, huge help because it's easy. You can just give a person a sheet of paper and it walks them through what the first couple turns are. It actually it makes sure that you have the right cars and it says, this is what you have in your hand. This is what you do with it. And here's why, you know? And like, 
you know, we saw this in the, the Mandy Patinkin video where he's reading through that, and sometimes it's crazy, but at the very least, he has a guide to get through there. Like, there's a re he, he understands there's a reason there. Whether or not it always makes sense on the card, you can at least read through it again, and somebody's not telling you, okay, do this now, you know? And it's like, okay, what well, do you have any questions? Well, I don't know what to ask, so no, I guess I don't have any questions. I just don't understand what happened. So getting into the game and actually seeing how it happens is a huge step as well. Don't get bogged down in the little things. Uh, and to your earlier point of don't you don't have to teach the whole game. That's that's a that's an excellent point. Sometimes a rule just doesn't ever come up during a game. So you've wasted five minutes of all of our lives by teaching me that when you go to the refractory space, that you have to turn in two dilithium crystals to get a cog. But if that never comes up, then why did anyone need to know if that's not even an important part of the game? Uh, one of <clears throat> one of my, my recent favorites, the Dwellings of Eldervale, there's no combat until everyone has taken a certain number of turns and has done a certain action. So I just say when I'm teaching the game, so there is fighting, but that can't happen yet. So we'll worry about that later. Because the sooner you can get people at least started moving pieces, playing cards, spending money, they're starting to, you know, they, they, they can only solidify and take in so much information at once. So if you give them just the little bit they need to get started, as long as you're not intentionally withholding information to give yourself some sort of advantage, but don't do that because that's a jerk move and you don't want to be a jerk. Um, and also, uh, narrate your turns. If you're the only person who knows how to play the game and people are still a little shaky, explain what you're doing and why you're doing it. And if necessary, you know, somebody like, oh, well, why didn't you go there and do that? Have an answer for that. Well, you know, that's... Uh, with the cards in my hand, that doesn't give me the resources that I need to play them. So I'm going to go here because even though that space gives me more resources overall, it's more important to be able to play cards out sooner. So I'm going to go here and just get a couple resources so I can play these cards sooner and then even be like, you know, because this card will do this for me and that's an effect the whole rest of the game. So it's better for me to get that out sooner um you know don't don't be afraid to throw away your first game the first time you're playing it with a group of people because if you're just sitting there quietly and you know all the rules and they don't and you're only answering people when they have a question obviously you're going to win and they're not going to have they're not going to stand up from the table and be like oh well that was fun and be like and that game kind of sucked yeah, they're not. Yeah. They're not gonna want to come back. I mean, at the um, end of the day, it's about you want to make sure they have yes. fun because if they have fun, they're gonna come back, and then you're gonna have fun the next time you play. Like it's it's about making sure that everybody at the table actually enjoys their experience. I like that you mentioned like narrating your turn, which is a funny like quirk that people who play a lot of board games like will do that. Uh, it's one of my favorite like uh, things is to listen to people taking their turn, and almost everybody starts their turn off with. I'm going to go ahead and uh, <laughs> the I'm going to go ahead is like one of my favorite things. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, move this guy here and get two gems so that I can convert them into. But it, it's a good habit to get into as a player. It sounds a little obnoxious, but it one, it keeps people engaged in what you're doing when it's not their turn, which kind of is something as just like board game etiquette. I mean, we all have this moment where we pick up our phone and kind of disengage a little bit. But if the person who's taking their turn is talking out loud about what they're doing. Like you kind of like have to like, you get pulled back in a little bit. So not everyone's engaged with the game, even when it's not their turn. And it's a great way to learn about strategy. Cause when somebody tells you what they're doing and their thought process, you're like, Oh, I didn't even know that's how that worked. Or I didn't see that. So that's a really uh, good little like tip that you can get into just as a game player and a host is just talk out loud about what you're doing. Um, I think, Something that I would throw in there as well is if it's a game that allows it, if the game is not based on hidden information, and even, even if it is to a certain extent, I think if you can, without breaking the game, share what you have and make sure people know what your decision-making space is, do that. Heck, if you can get everyone to do that, to everyone to have just completely open information, 
and show say okay this is what this is everything i have this is everything you have when i make a decision i'm choosing this card based on the other cards more so even than narrating your decision just making sure that everybody can see everything it gives them not only an understanding for why you're making decisions but it also gets them more familiarity with everything on the space because of course in a lot of games you're not going to interact with everything necessarily and so if they are aware of all of what's there they can selectively choose what they're paying attention to at any given moment so if you have the option if it doesn't just completely ruin anything obviously if you're playing you know like a mafia or something like that you're not going to say like i'm the mafia let's go you know let's let's go from there but if you're playing any game that allows you to flip your cards over without ruining the entire game i think doing that is a huge benefit because it allows people to much more clearly get a feel for what's going on absolutely and if if at all possible and the the way that you're teaching the game the capacity of teaching the game um when i used to to do game demos for simon invariably especially at conventions somebody has brought along their significant other to hang out at the convention with them and their significant other does not care about this game nearly as much as everyone else at the table does and that's fine that's to be expected you know everyone doesn't love everything whatever that's fine so i would not necessarily focus exclusively on that person but i would make sure that i'm giving that person an undue share of my attention and explanation because there was always this great moment and I, I considered it a failure as a teach even if everyone but that one person had bad time and when that one person goes from sitting back in their chair and now they're leaned in because now they need to see the game closer they need to look at their hand better they they need to keep a, a better eye on what's going on that's such a good such a great feeling moment when you like watch someone physically decide to i'm going to be a part of this now uh you know if if you're if it's a, a game with combat and conflict and somebody attacks somebody and you know that that player is in a position where they can really do something about it be like oh Doug, you just you're just gonna let josh just just ramshackle you like that you've got you've got like 15 units over there you're not just why don't you just run over and just pound him back into the dirt and, and salt the earth that nothing else may grow there? Um, you know, it's it's good to not necessarily, obviously don't tell people what to do, but if someone's turn comes up and they just kind of have the, the glassy eye, be like, you know, this would be a good moment for you to do this because you're in a great position to do this and it would benefit you greatly. I think one of the uh, secret skills to the whole thing of teaching a board game, and it's something that's kind of hard to teach some to teach this skill to get, but you just have to practice it, is getting good at summarizing rules, and that's hard to do, right? So one of the things you don't want to do, one of the one of the areas where you get really bogged down, is you just start reading from the rule book, and most rule books are bad. Uh, some rule books are okay and a very few rule books are very good but many and i would say most board game rule books are pretty bad they've been uh written in a fairly elevated like academic almost tone that is explaining concepts in a way that you know if you you have to read it two or three times to understand it and reading it out loud like the minute you start reading out loud from something to, to other people like they kind of just like something shuts off you know you can just see people like they're immediately like less engaged yeah so kind of one of the last things i want to throw out there because you know i think there's a lot we'll summarize our, our points when we get to the end i think but what are some of your big no-nos in teaching games we i mean we've already covered some you know don't read out a rule book learn the game beforehand but I think, like, you know, there's a couple big ones. Like, I think for me, don't undo players' turns. Like, you are there to guide and you're there to help. But if somebody does something really dumb, like, yeah, you need to give them agency to make mistakes because that's part of it. Don't let them, I mean, you know, if they're going to torpedo their entire game, if they're going to eliminate themselves, you might want to counsel them against it. But I think it's worth, like, just because they don't make an optimal choice 
doesn't mean you need to help them make the optimal choice so they learn what the optimal choice is. Just let them have the space to make mistakes. You don't need to undo somebody's turn just because something was slightly wrong or maybe there was a, a small rule infraction that doesn't matter. Like I think you need to give people the space to, to learn the game in your own in their own time. Absolutely. And don't get don't get so hung up on the one hundred percent exactly rules correct right answer sometimes sometimes it matters a whole bunch and sometimes it only kind of matters we have all we have all every one of us recording here everyone listening we've all been in the position where you're teaching a game and you're like 80 percent into the game and then you look up you grab the rule book to check something for someone and then you read down a paragraph and you're like oh oh that's <laughs> oh that's no how any of this works and you are <laughs> at the point in the game where you would have to basically start over and you just skip it and it's fine sometimes you and don't even bring it up you just learn let it let song. it sit and then next time say hey guys last time we played i forgot this it's kind of important it didn't it doesn't invalidate last game because we all did it wrong but just for next time this is how this works i want to throw out as a as a potential no-no would be also don't invite people over and then pull up the how to play video and be like let's watch this that's a, that feels like a real Bush League move. One, because it's about the same as reading out loud. Like, I don't think that people want to, like, watch the video. And not everybody, I don't think, really learn. Not not necessarily everybody learns well from watching it played. Like, they need to have it, like, taught to them in a more concise fashion. And they need to, like, play the game to learn it. So I think the how to play video industry has is really helpful it has been a good thing for the hobby, but it's mostly helpful for like the serious minded gamer who's bought the game and needs to get ready to teach it to other people. But I wouldn't exactly. use the video as like the crutch to get everyone else on board. I mean, at a minimum, I guess you could like text it out a day or two ahead of time and say, Hey, if anyone wants to watch this, this would be a good way to get ready for Saturday. But even then it might freak people out to see like a 20 minute video <laughs> pop up. Yeah, no, the video is for you to learn the game to help you teach it. Um, and uh, another thing, don't don't just don't just talk for an hour. I have some games in my collection. I, I I like a lot of really crunchy, complicated Euro games. But even when I'm teaching those, the teach itself may take a full hour. It may be one of those games where there's just so much going on and so many things that feed into other things. But don't just talk at people for an hour. This isn't a TED talk. You're you're sharing your knowledge with your friends. So when I get to the part of this is how you buy cards from the market, I'm going to talk about it, and then I'm going to show you how it works, and then I'm going to do a quick ocular pat down of everyone around the table. Are we all good? Are we, did I lose anybody? Did is someone get up and go to the kitchen to get a bowl of cereal in the middle of this? I'm going to strangle you, Samantha, but that's fine. I wait for her to come back, and we sit, sit down. And, you know, to, to your point, Ian, of, like, summarizing it, don't don't focus, like I said, don't focus so much on getting the rules 100% exactly right. Get people enough that they can do it, and then the first time somebody goes to buy cards, that's when you can maybe say, okay, so specifically, uh, you need to spend these resources in this configuration. And once, you, once you're a little bit into the teach, that's when you start passing out people's cards right and that's when they can look at and they don't know what it means yet but they have an understanding now so i guess to like kind of sum this up in, in kind of our kind of to, to put it in a nice little bow on it really the the key points you want to hit are you want to learn the game beforehand super important to make sure you know what you're talking about when you get people to the table have it try to have it set up or at least ha give them something that they can interact with make sure they're getting engaged early when you teach it start at the end make sure they know what they're doing make sure they know who they are and why they're doing it when you get into it don't get bogged down in the details keep it short keep it simple make sure they know exactly what to do and then jump into the game so you get them engaged early make sure that you are not getting too involved in your own game your job is to make sure that they enjoy themselves and at the end of the day it's about having fun it's a social event board games are a social thing you want to make sure you're having fun and so at the end of the day just remember you know, it's all about making sure you enjoy the time with the people you're at the table with. All right, so that's the episode. Before we 
finish up before we completely close i am going to go ahead and throw it out and just ask what is the hardest game that you guys have found to teach so for me the first one obviously you know like i could throw out something like root but i think for me pendulum is probably one of the hardest games i've had to teach just because it is a real-time game where everything's happening at once and there's so many moving pieces trying to get somebody to understand that game in any way and then the first playthrough you can't focus on it's just it's completely bonkers it's completely maddening it is so hard to teach and i'm hoping i can i can get people to, to stick with me a couple more rounds uh, i'm gonna go dead of winter I have uh, screwed the teaching of that game up on multiple occasions. There's so many fiddly little rules in that for how different things work, about how your colony of survivors in the zombie apocalypse, like how movement works, how combat works, how uh, frostbite works, how starvation works. And there's always something crucial that I forget or get wrong, and it negatively impacts the game in a horrible way. <laughs> and uh, so that one's just tricky, and that's just because of the volume of information you've got to get right. Uh, professionally, the, the hardest Simon game, it was always the game that I hated when I got assigned to, uh, was any version of Arcadia Quest beyond just the base game because every version of the game is the base game plus a whole bunch of other nonsense and there's always so much going on and you have to know all of it before you start moving your guys around and it, it's it's a very hard to teach game uh, personally from my own collection would probably be something like uh, Lorenzo Il Magnifico or uh, Newton. These are these are just Euroy, dry, almost completely themeless. There's there's nothing that makes sense like thematically. Um, those are those are games that I only play with the group of friends who plays Euro games. You know, I I, I feel like I, I have two main gaming groups. One group that plays uh, lots of games, and then one group that really just plays Euro games. And I, there are games I cannot take to the first group that the second group will dive into because they can, they can, they have that capacity to take in all of that, just inscrutable, the difference between capital P privilege in the rule book and lowercase p privilege in the rule book, and they're different. Yeah, I'm already angry about that. And they're different. <laughs> it can get, it can get so completely maddening at times. That is going to be our episode for this week. Of course, you know, stick around next week. We'll be doing a captain's log, and then, two, and then two weeks from now, we'll have another main episode. Thank you, as always, for listening. We appreciate it so much. If you do enjoy the podcast, consider giving us a like or subscribe on your podcast app of choice. Or you can reach out, tell us about your experience with teaching games or games that you found it difficult to do so. Matt, if people do want to reach out to us, where can they do that? They can find us on the gram. Find us on Instagram at Dice Pirates. Um, we're there all week long, posting updates, reviews, uh, all sorts of stuff about what we're playing and what we're doing, and we would love to hear from you. Please do reach out. We love to get in contact with you. We'll be back soon, but until then, we'll be right here on the Dice Pirates. Teach more games. See, I changed it.